In the early stages of the war, relatively few Northerners saw their goal as freeing the slaves. The Northern armies fought to preserve the Union, not to end slavery. But individuals, such as Fremont, took steps early on that moved the Union closer to emancipation. General Benjamin Butler in Virginia, May 1861, made the decision that he would not return fugitive slaves to their southern masters. Those states, he argued, could not secede from the Union and then demand that their rights to human property under the Fugitive Slave Law be protected by the federal government. Butler declared that these slaves were contraband of war and put them to work for the Union forces. He did not arm them, but every job completed by a contraband freed a white soldier to fight. And within a few months, he had almost a thousand contrabands. Harriet Tubman, the famed conductor of the Underground Railroad, joined General Butler's forces to help organize and care for the contrabands. In August 1861, Congress passed and Lincoln signed the first Confiscation Act, which made this policy official. When Fremont issued his personal Emancipation Proclamation in Missouri, Lincoln directed him to modify it to comport with the Confiscation Act. That is, rather than freeing all slaves belonging to Confederates, Fremont could only declare free those slaves who had been used to support the Confederacy. When Fremont refused to make these changes, Lincoln was forced to overrule the general and remove him from office. This decision helped Lincoln maintain the loyalty of the border states, but drew a harsh reaction from radical Republicans. Frederick Douglass, in particular, had praised Fremont's action and was angered by Lincoln's move. The weakness and imbecility of the letter of the president condemning that proclamation have thus far characterized the whole war. But Lincoln believed that people in the North were not ready to make this war about abolishing slavery. What Lincoln and many in the North felt was lacking in this war was actual fighting by those now splendidly trained and equipped troops under McClellan. McClellan had no interest in freeing the slaves. He wrote to influential fellow Democrat Samuel Barlow, Help me to dodge the nigger. We want nothing to do with him. I am fighting to preserve the integrity of the Union and the power of the government, and no other issue. To gain that end, we cannot afford to mix up the Negro question. It must be incidental and subsidiary. McClellan had done an excellent job training the new Army of the Potomac, as well as preparing the defenses of Washington. But he was showing himself to be overcautious as a military commander. Again and again, when pressed by Lincoln for action, he would insist that Confederate forces outnumbered his own. This despite the fact that in October he had 120,000 men facing just 45,000 Confederates across the Potomac. In October there was one minor skirmish, but once again it turned out badly for the Union. Colonel Edward Baker, who was a senator from Oregon and a personal friend of Lincoln's, was attempting to dislodge Confederate forces from Leesburg, Virginia. Instead, he and his men were surrounded by Confederates at a place called Ball's Bluff. Baker was killed in the fighting, and his men were driven back over the edge of the bluff in a panicked rout. As many men died of drowning as of bullet wounds, and hundreds more were captured by the rebels. This debacle did not encourage McClellan into action. As the fall wore on, finally becoming winter, the Army of the Potomac sat. As historian James M. McPherson has noted, McClellan excelled at preparation, but it was never quite complete. The army was perpetually almost ready to move, but the enemy was always larger and better prepared. In early 1862, 
a fighting general did emerge in the Western theater of the war. General Ulysses S. Grant led assaults on important southern river forts. On February 6th, he led two divisions in the capture of the undermanned Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. The fort was taken with minimal losses, and Grant moved quickly over land to assault Fort Donelson on the Cumberland River. Grant faced stronger resistance at Donelson, but after a series of attacks and counterattacks between the two sides, by February 16th, Grant's command of the field was so clear that the Confederate commanders, Brigadier General John Floyd and his second in command, Brigadier General Gideon Pillow, panicked. Buckner was an old acquaintance of Grant's, going back to their years at West Point and service in the Army. Perhaps Buckner thought this would mean better terms of surrender for him and his men. If so, he was proven wrong. In response to Buckner's request to discuss terms, Grant sent the following message. Yours of this date, proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation is just received. No terms except an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner replied that circumstances compelled him to accept Grant's ungenerous and unchivalrous terms. The capture of Fort Henry and Fort Donelson were the first major victories by Union forces, and they were celebrated wildly. Ulysses S. Grant became known throughout the North as Unconditional Surrender Grant. Over 12,000 Confederate soldiers were captured, setting up another, much bloodier, Union victory months later at Shiloh. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.